to the last uh, day of uh, this conference before we uh, introduce you our uh, keynote speaker this morning. Uh, I would like on behalf of the organizers to ask you to check uh, your app and uh, complete the survey about this Congress. So, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce you uh, Professor Dr. Catherine Taminen, the last keynote, the keynote of this last day of the conference. We have another keynote this afternoon. And uh, Dr. Catherine Taminen is an associate professor in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Physical Education at the University of Toronto. Her research program in sports psychology draws on qualitative and quantitative methodological approaches and focuses on two main areas. First, stress, coping, and emotion regulation. And second, youth athletes' experiences in sport and the influence of parents and coaches in youth sport. Her research has been awarded over two million Canadian dollars as a primary investigator and co-investigator during her academic career. She has published over 100 research articles and chapters uh, in various books. She is currently the president of the Canadian uh, Society of Psychomotor Learning and Sports Psychology and a member at large with the International Society of Qualitative Research in Sport and Exercise. She also serves as an associate editor for the journal International Review of Sport and Exercise Psychology and on the editorial boards of Psychology of Sport and Exercise and Sport and Exercise and Performance Psychology. In addition to her research and teaching, Catherine also works as a psychotherapist and provides clinical psychotherapy services for athletes, coaches, and individuals working in various high-performance high um, uh, environments, including, of course, sports, but also music and performance arts. Welcome. Please give an upload and well to welcome Professor Dr. Catherine Taminen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you for being here today. Um, I know it's the last day of the conference, and it's wonderful to see such a, a big crowd at 8.30 in the morning. So thank you for being here. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank the conference organizers for inviting me to uh, step in as a keynote um, when Dr. Sabaston was unable to make it. Um, I'm, I, this is certainly a challenge and an opportunity in keeping with the theme of the conference, but I'm really honored and excited to be here to talk about my research. I also want to thank the conference organizers for putting on such a fantastic conference this week. It has been really one of the better conferences that I think I've ever attended. The quality of the research has been fantastic. And I also want to thank the technical staff and all of the volunteers and staff who are working to support the conference. I know how challenging it is to put on a conference and it's just been really fantastic. So to be able to be part of this event is, is really wonderful. So today I'm going to be talking about advancing research on interpersonal and social aspects of emotion regulation in sport. Um, this is an area that I've been interested in really over the course of my entire career, um, although I've really um, focused more strongly on this area in the last five to ten years. Um, to give you a sense of where this research started, 
in the beginning of my academic career, my master's thesis research um, focused on exploring the stressors and coping strategies that were used by adolescent female athletes. And I wanted to understand how young female athletes experience stressors in the sport environment, how they cope with those stressors, and how that influences their um, sport participation experiences. So in this qualitative study, um, although I said it was a qualitative study, but in the final manuscript, we see a, a variation of a type of qualitative analysis. Um, but I was interested in looking at how the, quali uh, how the stressors and coping strategies that athletes experienced changed over different phases of the season. And although um, I was interested in looking in those longitudinal changes in coping over time, one of the things that um, I found going back to that thesis research that I conducted was that I was always really interested in the social context in which these experiences took place. So um, this diagram was you know, an early diagram from my thesis research. It never made it into the published manuscript. But in going back and revisiting that work, I realized that I've really always been interested in understanding how athletes' experiences are influenced by the social context around them. And so in the research that I've been conducting over the last several years, I've been looking at how social influences um, are connected to experiences of stress and coping in sport. So in this presentation, I'm gonna be making a case for why we might want to study emotions and emotion regulation from an interpersonal perspective. I'll be reviewing some of the research I've done in this area on interpersonal and social aspects of emotion and emotion regulation. And then I'll conclude with some suggestions and ideas for um, key directions for future research. So to situate this research, it's important to provide an overview of where a lot of the work in this area tends to, to focus on. Um, and so those of you are, who are familiar with Lazarus and Folkman, uh, his cognitive motivational relational theory of emotion, um, is a, a cognitivist appraisal-based model that suggests that individuals' appraisals of stressors are influenced by um, factors related to their own goals and values, their beliefs about the world, as well as uh, by factors in their environment. And these appraisals inform their core relational uh, meanings about those events, which then informs the types of emotions that may arise and also the coping strategies that they may use to deal with those stressors. The role of appraisal is also evident in the theory of challenge and threat states that we see frequently used within the sport and exercise psychology literature, which suggests that the way in which individuals appraise a situation, either as a challenge or as a threat, will likely have differential effects on their physiological and emotional experiences, and then that may impact their performance in positive or negative ways. More recently, we see the role of appraisal being emphasized even more strongly in a revised theory of challenge and threat states, where primary appraisals and reappraisals uh, will influence the types of experiences that athletes have and perhaps how they might cope with those stressors. And as a result of a lot of this research that's been grounded in these cognitivist appraisal-based approaches, we have a wealth of information about the ways that athletes appraise stressors, the dimensions of those stressor appraisals, and what makes something more stressful for one person than another, or what features of that stressor leads to a more intense emotional experience. We know about how appraisals influence performance, and we also know how athletes might regulate their emotions and cope with those stressors, which has led to the development of stress, coping, or stress management and coping interventions. And we also have increasing information about gender, age, and developmental differences in coping and emotion regulation. However, these theories that we've tended to draw on in the sport and exercise psychology literature have also been criticized and so in the broader field of psychology, um, some of these approaches have been criticized for perhaps being too individualistic in their approach. Um, and so in the late 90s, Hobfall and colleagues suggested that these theories um, tend to embrace a notion of rugged individualism. And rugged individualism, they say, pits a person against the elements in a fight for survival, 
but as a result, important gender and ethnic differences in coping might be missed by adopting this lone ranger person against the elements perspective. And so Hobfall and colleagues suggested that these individualistic models of coping tend to ignore social aspects of coping. And these models imply that direct action is preferred, whereas more social or communal models of coping might emphasize that social coping could be indirect. So it may narrow the kinds of things we think of as coping strategies because of the models we've used to investigate these phenomena. Subsequently, Hobfall argued that this interpretation that our appraisals are centrally ideographic and individualized reflects a cultural Western bias that champions the crystallized self and sees it as divisible from the embedded self. So it sees it as divisible from the self embedded within society. Further goes on to suggest that the study of stress appraisals has yielded little information about why people make certain appraisals the extent to which these appraisals are automatic outgrowths of learned or overlearned rules of interpretation, and the extent to which these appraisals are shared and culturally scripted. So I'm not sure that I would go that far and say that it's yielded little information, but I do recognize the criticism here. And these criticisms are, are relevant, but I also wish to note that Lazarus actually did talk about the role of, of the individual and society in, in his work, and so with uh, Susan Folkman as well. They said that with respect to stress and emotion, society is viewed as making stressful demands on the individual and imposing constraints on the ways that individuals might deal with these demands. But they also went on to say that the shaping of emotional reactions, as well as how they are expressed or managed, do hinge on the meaning and significance that culture gives to this human transaction with the environment, and that similar principles apply to the expression and management of emotions. So it's in there. Lazarus was talking about these things in chapter 8. So what happened to chapter 8? I, I'm not sure, but I think part of it could just be that chapters 1 through 7 contain so much good information about trying to understand appraisals and coping and understanding how individuals interact and transact with their environment that perhaps we've just not it fully embraced all of uh, chapter eight in our study of appraisals and coping. So it was there, it's just, you know, hasn't fully been embraced. Now within the sport and exercise psychology literature, these criticisms have also been made. I'm not the only one making this case. Um, Bob Valorand in 1983 said that within an experimental paradigm, emotion has often been studied in a vacuum. Um, Hannon in 1989 also made the, uh, the criticism that given the importance of the social environment as a primary determinant of emotion, it seems strange um, that stress and anxiety have been studied in a vacuum. And Jones in 2012 in the Oxford Handbook of Sports Psychology also drew attention to the role of emotions in groups. So it's not that we haven't been thinking about these things, it's just that in more recent years we've really been able to turn our attention to studying these processes. So why would it be valuable to study interpersonal and social aspects of emotion regulation? Well, I, I do feel that it is important to understand not only how individuals regulate their own emotions and cope with stressors, but also how others might influence that process. So understanding how individuals regulate one another's emotions could lead to a fuller understanding of that emotion regulation process. This could have benefits for sport performance, and it could also have impacts on individuals' well-being. And that could be both positive and negative impacts on well-being. There could be costs associated with engaging in these processes. These could then lead to benefits for teammate relationships and cohesion, and we could have a better understanding of the role of emotions in interpersonal communication and conflict. So I think there are a number of reasons why we ought to continue working in this area. So the key questions that I've sought to explore in this field then um, are to look at how emotions are experienced socially and interpersonally, to understand how people influence one another's emotions and their coping and emotion regulation in sport, and then to look at some of the consequences or outcomes of these processes. 
So one of the studies that I'll start with to frame some of this was a qualitative study that we did asking varsity um, student athletes about their experiences of emotions. Uh, we asked team and individual sport athletes about their experiences of their individual experiences of emotions, but also the kinds of emotions they experience or, or how emotions are experienced in team and group settings. And so this first quote here is from um, a male swimmer who was talking about how um, he experienced what we would describe as group-based emotions as a function of being part of a team. Even when he wasn't competing in a national championship that his team won, he said he just felt really happy and proud that I was part of the team. Even though I'm not necessarily the fastest, just being part of the team is a great feeling. And this connects to some of the work that Mick Campo and colleagues have done looking at social identity and group-based emotions. Athletes also talked about the experience of collective emotions, which are a type of group-based emotions that you might experience when you're all in the same room together. So a male hockey player said that after any win, that emotion is pretty uniform throughout the room. Guys are all happy, dancing around, celebrating and stuff. It's a very memorable thing to be a part of. And this work was also situated within a social functional perspective of emotions, which suggests that emotions serve social functions and they communicate values to others. And so athletes also talked about some of those social functions of emotions when we were asking them about those emotional experiences. So for example, athletes would often talk about the impact of these emotional expressions on team functioning and performance. So one women's volleyball player said, if someone comes in with a negative attitude and a few other people have that same negative attitude, it does kind of dampen the team spirit. It's going to ruin the team dynamic. So here we hear, we're hearing things around emotional contagion and how negative emotions can spread throughout a team and ruin the team dynamic. And athletes also spoke about how expressing or not expressing certain emotions in certain contexts could communicate values to others in the room. So one of the women's soccer players in this study said that after a loss, if you were the only one in the change room crying about a loss or something, I would feel really frustrated because it would make me feel like I was the only one who really cared and wanted it. And so we make inferences about others' values and their ideas and opinions and beliefs based on their emotional expressions, and this could influence team functioning. And so, um, as an outreach or an extension of this research, I've been interested in understanding not only how athletes experience emotions in groups, but how athletes regulate one another's emotions in team and group settings. And so, for this work, um, I'll be talking about interpersonal emotion regulation and drawing primarily on uh, the work of Niven, who suggests that interpersonal emotion regulation refers to the processes by which people deliberately attempt to influence others' feelings. Interpersonal emotion regulation is a goal-directed process, and it has an affective target, so the goal is to influence others' emotions. It's deliberate, and it has a social target, so the goal is to influence others. Um, but importantly, Niven has also um, suggested that interpersonal emotion regulation or strategies to influence others' emotions are also associated with our own self-regulation strategies. And so in her measure of um, interpersonal emotion regulation, it includes items that ask participants about how they worsen or improve the emotions of others, as well as how individuals might engage in those strategies towards themselves, so self-regulation as well. Um, so one study that we did to initially, one of the first studies that I did looking at interpersonal emotion regulation was um, an ethnographic case study among a team of female high-performance curlers. And so for this study, I essentially joined the team. I didn't join the team. I'm not a curler. I'm not very good at curling. But I joined the team um, and attended their practices, their competitions, conducted interviews and observations, traveled with the team. And they were a fairly competitive and, and fairly successful team of female high-performance curlers. And in this study, um, we identified a number of different strategies that athletes were engaging in that appeared to influence the emotions or attempt to influence the emotions of, of other teammates. 
Um, so one of the examples that really highlighted this process was um, one example in a very important competition, which would mean whether or not the team would move on to the provincial championships or not. And um, the team had been losing, but then in one of their ends in competition, um, they gained a bunch of points. And so this put them in a position to win as long as they could maintain their lead. And so in the interviews after that competition, um, the athletes all spoke about this event. And they talked about how the skip, who in curling the skip is like the team captain or leader, they talked about how the skip came down and got everybody together and said, okay guys, let's take a deep breath. And she explained that the reason this was important was chances are that if you have a really great end in competition, a lot of teams, the next end will bomb. So she did say, let's refocus so that we could manage our emotions in order to maintain our competitive advantage. Another athlete also spoke about the same thing, saying that um, when she was, she, uh, so for the third, the, that position on the team, they call out the points at the end of the end. And when she was saying that, she could hear her own voice quiver but then the skip came down and started talking to us and she said, okay, we just need a second for all of us to come back down. And so there were a number of events where the leader on the team really seemed to engage in a lot of those emotion regulation strategies to influence the emotions of her teammates. But this also demonstrated the link between interpersonal emotion regulation and self-regulation, where the skip said that she needs to control her own emotions for the sake of the team. She says, there's a lot of self-control where I can be madder than a hornet about something, but I cannot show it because it's upsetting to the rest of the team. It'll just completely throw them off. And then later she said, heaven forbid I ever let it slip when I'm present with the team or when we're in the middle of a game that I'm scared. I try to keep that quiet from the team when I'm seeking support because it's not good to let them know that. Probably again, because as a skip, you can't show fear. And so there's some social norms around expressions of emotions here as well. And other athletes also talked about how um, their own regulatory capacity influenced the extent to which they could even engage in these processes with teammates. And so one athlete said, sometimes you don't even have the mental capacity to say what they need to hear. I only have so much energy and it's all taken up on my own situation. And so these results were really valuable and provided a platform for us to investigate other um, aspects of interpersonal emotion regulation related to the kinds of things people were doing in these situations, the roles of leaders, and also the influence that this has on individuals' own experience of emotion regulation. So extending this work further, um, I sought to investigate how adolescent athletes in team sports regulate one another's emotions. Um, so for this study, uh, we engaged uh, 450 adolescent athletes from like 38 or 39 teams um, to examine the ways that their interpersonal emotion regulation was first associated with their own self-regulation and also to look at how these interpersonal regulation strategies are associated with their experiences of enjoyment or commitment in sport. Because these are important outcomes for youth athletes and we wanna keep athletes engaged in sport for a long time. I'll just provide some um, overview of some of the correlations and findings that we have here. We used Bayesian multi-level models, which is a very different direction from the previous qualitative research I've done, and it certainly stretched my thinking. Um, and I'm grateful for some very supportive colleagues in helping me work through these analyses. But some of the key findings that I'll just mention here are first, that athletes' self-regulation was correlated with their interpersonal emotion regulation. So athletes who said that they engaged in more strategies to improve their own emotions were also reporting that they engaged in more strategies to improve others' emotions on their team. And this was also the case for other worsening affect regulation strategies. So athletes who said that they do more things that make themselves feel bad during competition also reported doing that towards other athletes on their team as well, making other people on their team feel bad. Um, so there's a correlation between self and interpersonal emotion regulation there. And we also saw that interpersonal emotion regulation strategies were associated with athletes' experiences of enjoyment and commitment. And so athletes who reported that they engaged in greater um, efforts to improve the emotions of their teammates also reported greater enjoyment and commitment. 
and also athletes who said that they engage in more strategies to make other people feel worse on their team reported a negative correlation with enjoyment and commitment. So cross-sectional design, we can't infer causality, probably a reciprocal relationship, but there were some interesting correlations here. We also looked at the extent to which these relationships were moderated by the team climate. I'll just touch briefly on that um, relationship here as well. Um, but one of the things that we found was that um, athletes who were on teams that endorsed a higher um, peer motivational climate that was ego oriented or that um, emphasized comparisons between teammates or teammates were more interested in performing better than one another. On those teams where there was this ego peer motivational climate, um, athletes who engaged in more affect worsening towards their teammates reported lower levels of enjoyment compared to those athletes on teams where um, they you know, didn't have the same level of uh, ego motivational climate. So this also does suggest that there are differences between teams and that these things do vary between teams and so multi-level models are helpful for investigating those associations. Um, and this does provide some further evidence for the relationships that we were building on in our previous work. Um, another approach that we wanted to investigate or another question that we wanted to investigate was whether or not these effects change over time. Um, we had previously done qualitative longitudinal research and we've done some cross-sectional work. Um, but one of the next studies that I engaged in was to do a daily diary study to look at patterns of interpersonal emotion regulation and team performance over time. Um, and so for this work, we had um, 59 athletes from six teams um, complete daily surveys of their emotions and interpersonal emotion regulation in the days leading up to competition and the days following competition. And we saw some really interesting patterns of results here. Um, so I'll just highlight a little bit here, but this pattern here, we saw that this was um, affect worsening. So the extent to which athletes are making one another feel worse about themselves or their performance in the days leading up to competition and after competition. And we saw that there was a significant decrease in affect worsening between teammates in the days leading up to competition. So a few days out from competition, athletes might be doing more things to make one another feel worse. Um, and we asked also, you know, to what extent are you doing these things and to what extent are others doing this towards you? And we saw these patterns of decrease in the days leading up to competition and then a bit of a rebound in the days after competition. So this first suggests that on competition days, athletes might be being nicer to one another than they are in the days leading up to competition. And we also looked at the extent to which these patterns of interpersonal emotion regulation prior to competition could predict the team's performance in competition that week. Um, and there were some complicated analyses here, and this was moderated by athletes' perceived levels of social support from their teammates. Um, but what we found was that if we um, look at athletes for whom they typically perceive high levels of social support from their teammates, um, if those athletes were reporting an increase in the receipt of affect worsening from their other teammates in the week leading up to competition, those patterns could actually influence performance and lead to or could lead to the team losing in competition that week. So we did find a significant effect where um, for athletes who normally feel quite supported by their teammates, but in the week leading up to competition saw an increase in affect worsening, um, that was predictive of the team losing in competition that week. So it suggests that there are some team dynamics that are fluctuating over time, and it suggests that these patterns and associations may have an impact on team performance. Now, one of the limitations in this analysis is that we hadn't looked um, here at the interaction with self-regulation, and we also didn't factor in the impact on emotion during competition. So in some subsequent research, um, which uh, I worked on with a number of colleagues who are here today and thankful for their contributions to this work. Uh, we surveyed athletes after a competition and asked them about the extent to which they engaged in self-regulation and interpersonal emotion regulation during competition 
and then examine the associations between those regulatory strategies and anxiety during competition, as well as with their subjective goal attainment in that competition. And we controlled for the, whether the team won or lost there. Um, so in this research, um, one of the things we first looked at were the associations between self-regulation and anxiety and goal outcome and found that um, athletes who reported engaging in more self-regulation to worsen their emotions. So I, you know, I ruminate about my uh, negative performance. I make myself feel bad. Um, that was associated with a higher uh, report of anxiety during competition and um, was negatively associated with goal attainment. So much like the previous research that has taken that individualistic perspective, we're you know, replicating and supporting those previous findings. Um, we also saw that athletes um, who reported engaging in strategies to improve their own emotions demonstrated a positive association with goal attainment. So this also supports previous research. And interestingly, in this hypothesized model where we had self-regulation and interpersonal emotion regulation in our model, we actually found no association between interpersonal emotion regulation in competition with anxiety during competition and with, oh, sorry, it's the next slide, and with goal attainment. So this was perplexing. This suggested that, you know, we hadn't found what we thought we might find, which I get excited about whenever, you know, we find that there's actually something that didn't come out the way you thought. This is really exciting. Um, so we went, well, what might be going on here? And we, you know, considered our previous research and theoretical explanations for, for why these patterns might be um, happening. Um, and one of the things that could be occurring here is that the effect of self-regulation might be taking up or explaining too much of the variance, and so we're not seeing much of an effect of interpersonal emotion regulation when we're also accounting for self-regulation. And so in another model, we uh, conducted further exploratory analyses where we constrained the paths from self-regulation to anxiety and goal attainment to zero. And in that model, we did see positive associations between um, athletes' interpersonal emotion regulation with anxiety and also with goal attainment. And so what these results suggest is that both of these processes are functioning or operating within this competitive environment. And it suggests that perhaps interpersonal emotion regulation may be more important for those athletes um, who lack the capacity to engage in effective self-regulation. Um, so we need to do more work looking at how athletes are regulating their own emotions and whether or not athletes who are perhaps less effective in their self-regulation may uh, rely more on the regulatory actions of their teammates. Okay. So we've been talking a lot about interpersonal emotion regulation, talking a lot about teammates. What about coaches? There are a lot of people who study coaching in the room here, um, and we have done a couple of studies looking at interpersonal emotion regulation among uh, coaches and their athletes. So in one of these studies conducted by a former master's student of mine, um, she conducted a, a longitudinal or prospective qualitative study over a period of um, four weeks, but two weeks of audio diaries with five male coaches and 10 athletes from individual sports. Uh, this included, so one athlete, or sorry, one coach and two athletes, and we had five of those triads, um, where she interviewed the participants and asked them to complete audio diaries at the end of each competition or practice over a two-week period. And in this study, she was really interested in exploring and understanding the kinds of strategies that coaches and athletes are using in these practice and competitive environments, and also looking at you know, how these are influenced by the coach-athlete relationship and the wider competitive context. Um, so there's a, a very complicated diagram that she developed to try to explain all of these relationships, but just to summarize some of the key findings here, um, the, the results in this study suggested that a number of factors in the immediate context are likely to influence the emotions that athletes and coaches are experiencing and also the strategies that athletes and coaches are using to try to regulate the athlete's emotions. So things like how the athlete is performing and the number of athletes attending practice that day, um, the performance expectations of the coach and the athlete are all reported to influence these um, interpersonal regulation strategies. 
And these are also influenced by broader factors such as the coach-athlete relationship and personal preferences and the um, wider contextual factors. But in her analysis of the athlete's audio diary um, entries, and we also collected audio diaries from the coaches, um, she looked at, on the top panel here, we have the emotions that the athletes reported at each practice or competition. And then below, we have the different types of emotion regulation strategies that um, either coaches or athletes reported using. And we can see on different days that on some days when coaches were present, they were reporting that they were experiencing these interpersonal regulation strategies from their coach. And on days when the coaches weren't present at competition or at practice, um, the athletes seem to be reporting greater use of self-regulation strategies. And this aligns with our previous work that suggests that there might be a, an interrelationship between the extent to which athletes are regulating their own emotions depending on whether or not other people are around to help them regulate their emotions. And this also goes on to suggest that perhaps we need to think about how coaches and sports psychology practitioners can be helpful um, in helping athletes to regulate their emotions for competition, but also how that could potentially create a dependency or a situation where athletes are perhaps not developing regulation strategies to deal with emotions on their own. So I think there's a, a two-way street here. Um, subsequent research that was recently published uh, by Dr. Jimin Kim, who is um, unfortunately moving on to a new position at Michigan State University. I say unfortunately because he's been such a fantastic researcher in my lab. Um, but we extended this research to look at interpersonal emotion regulation from coaches. Um, and in this work, we looked not only at the strategies that um, coaches reported using to regulate their athletes' emotions, but also looking at whether or not those strategies that coaches are reporting are influenced by their beliefs about the utility of emotions and their beliefs about the utility of regulating their athletes' emotions. So some coaches report that they feel that positive emotions might be helpful for performance or that negative emotions could be helpful for performance. And similarly, some coaches report that the use of strategies to try to make athletes feel worse can actually be helpful for performance. And so we wanted to investigate some of those pieces, um, drawing on some work on the motives for interpersonal emotion regulation and beliefs about emotion regulation. So I'll just highlight a couple findings here. Um, what we saw here was that um, if coaches felt that pleasant or positive emotions are going to be helpful for their athletes in competition, they were more likely to report engaging in strategies to upregulate or boost those positive emotions among their athletes. And we also saw that for coaches who felt that um, imp or sorry, worsening their athletes' emotions would be helpful for performance, they actually reported engaging in more of those strategies towards their athletes. And so it suggests that these things aren't just happening in a vacuum, they're influenced by our beliefs and our understandings about what effect emotions might actually have on performance. And um, some qualitative uh, interviews conducted with coaches as part of this study um, also highlighted that these processes were really individualized and that coaches had an understanding, or some coaches had an understanding, of the individualized nature of affect regulation with their athletes. So as one coach here said, it depends and would vary on how these emotions would affect athletes. Some coaches might use unpleasant emotions as fuel for fire, but for others it could be detrimental for athletes from being involved and those athletes might drop out from sport altogether. So, from this line of research that I've been talking about here today, uh, we have more knowledge, more information about interpersonal emotion regulation occurring between teammates and also from coaches to athletes. We also have information that interpersonal emotion regulation and self-regulation are linked and that these processes seem to be associated with important outcomes, such as enjoyment, commitment, performance, both team performance and individual subjective performance goal attainment. And we have some information here that interpersonal emotion regulation is influenced by our beliefs about emotions and emotion regulation. 
So where do we go from here? I want to recognize that I am occupying a very small corner of a lot of the research that's been done, drawing on a lot of different concepts and theories um, related to interpersonal and social phenomena in sport. And so uh, I you know, have presented this um, in a previous presentation this week that there's one aspect of this, but there's a lot more going on in this space. And I also want to recognize the work of my colleagues and uh, folks who are here today. Um, in a review paper that will be coming out very shortly, I hope um, my colleagues Svenja Wolf and I, as well as uh, students Jamie Bissett and Rachel Dunn, have been trying to synthesize and integrate a lot of the research related to the experience, expression, and regulation of emotions in sport. Um, and so we have a review coming out where we've tried to develop some synergies or integration between this, these different areas and also drawing attention to the fact that these are going to be influenced by contextual factors, cultural factors, norms, and roles in the environment. I also just, I wanna highlight that there are other people doing great work in this space that have been published recently, have been presented this week at the conference that will be presented soon at another conference in Durham on qualitative research coming up at the end of the month. So there are a lot of great people doing a lot of great work in this space. And so in trying to provide suggestions for future research, I can speak to the area that I'm you know, most intimately um, familiar with, but there's other work out there and I wanna recognize that. Um, in terms of some next steps forward, I think one of the key pieces that is important that I've been trying to say over and over in recent years is that we need to have really clear definitions of what interpersonal emotion regulation is and also to reduce conceptual overlap or conceptual confusion within the field. And I think that's a take home message that students and others can apply in any field. We need to be very aware of our conceptual overlap and also trying to avoid jingle jangle fallacies in the field because this makes it harder to advance our field of research as a whole. Um, we need to look at how things like interpersonal emotion regulation and intrinsic or self-regulation overlap with other processes like emotional labor. And uh, Dixon Gordon and colleagues also have a really nice paper distinguishing interpersonal emotion regulation from other things such as social support and emotional contagion. In terms of data collection and analysis, um, I do think it, it is very important for replication and extension of results in this, or in this quantitative findings that I've reported. Um, and in keeping in that area, we could probably do a better job on the measurement of interpersonal emotion regulation and drawing on more complex multi-level models and social network analyses to look at how these things function within teams and using more longitudinal designs. Um, but I really think it's important to stick with and go back to qualitative research because I find that it provides us with so much knowledge and information about all of the complexity of these pieces. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of value that could be gained from using ethnographic accounts, narrative inquiry, and conversation analysis to look not only at how these processes function, but to look at what these tell us about the sport environment how individuals' experiences and expressions of emotions and how they're regulated maybe reflect broader norms about what it means to um, express emotions appropriately and how athletes might be silenced or told not to express their emotions. And then we can certainly get into how that might impact other areas of athletes' experiences. So I think drawing on qualitative research uh, approaches will be valuable here. And there's certainly more work to be done in the applied field, looking at how we might engage coaches in training and developing their own self-regulation and the regulation of their athletes, uh, looking at how we could increase individuals' capacity for self and interpersonal emotion regulation. And one piece that I'm really interested and excited about is some of the work that we see in um, research going with, uh, I think this is with Jeremy Jameson's lab at the University of Rochester. So Oves and colleagues demonstrated um, that by engaging some students in a classroom in reappraisal training for um, appraising um, academic exams or stressors as a challenge instead of a threat, they actually found that by engaging some students in that reappraisal training intervention, demonstrated spillover effects into other students in the classroom who had not received that intervention. And it, it gets me excited in thinking about how we can intervene with some athletes, with some leaders or some influential members within a team, uh, which could then positively impact the emotion regulation processes beyond that smaller group of team members. So I think some opportunity to look at spillover effects would be really exciting in this space. I think we could connect this to athlete mental health and clinical issues related to emotional dynamics and emotional regulation and dysregulation in teams and groups. 
And for those of you who know, I actually do quite a lot of research also in youth sport and parents in youth sport. So I think we really have an exciting opportunity to look at the development of self and interpersonal motion regulation abilities in young athletes. We could look at how coaches and parents influence the regulation of young athletes' emotions. And drawing on something like Dr. Joanne Dohanty's emotion-focused skills training for parents as um, an opportunity to try to engage parents in that uh, regulatory process with young athletes. So with that, um, I want to thank uh, the funding and the support that I've received over the last several years to conduct this line of research. I want to thank my students and colleagues again for also supporting me and to all of you for being here at 8.30 in the morning in this very warm room um, and for your attention today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful uh, keynote address. We have uh, time for a few questions. So, yes. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Thank you so much. Um, to speak so eloquently with such short notice was, a real, was really admirable and it was a privilege to listen to you and your body of work, so thank you so much. Um, you mentioned at the end there a little bit about the development of emotion regulation and I just wondered if you could reflect on two things, if I may. One, what some of the key questions are that we need to answer in that area and two, how on earth do we go about doing that? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, boy, there's a lot that could be packed into that. It's a whole trajectory of research. So when we think about the development of emotion regulation in young athletes, there's a few things to think about there. Adolescents, who are often elite athletes during adolescence, but they're not many adults. They haven't developed all of the cognitive capacities that adults have. So we need to take a developmental perspective and think about the cognitive and sociocognitive maturity and development of young athletes. So that's one piece. I think we have to not take all of the assumptions that we have about the capacity for emotion regulation that um, adults have and just apply it straight to young athletes. Um, I think we also have to question our assumptions about what it means to develop effective emotion regulation. Um, sometimes some of the strategies that we might suggest are effective for emotion regulation in sport might actually be mal maladaptive or harmful if we think about them in other contexts of our lives. So, um, excessive use of emotional suppression has been associated with um, negative um, psychosocial and, and mental health outcomes. So I think we need to be also cautious about the extent to which we overemphasize certain emotion regulation capacities. Um, so thinking clearly about what it is, what are the emotional skills or abilities that we want young athletes to develop is important. And then thinking about the fact that young athletes exist in a social context, in a social environment, and Camilla spoke to this yesterday, that um, parents, coaches, organizational systems all have a, an impact on this process. So. In moving forward, I think first, I mean, I, I want to understand what is going on. I think we need to understand through qualitative and quantitative, good, strong, descriptive, theoretically informed research before we tr jump in to intervene too quickly, although we can gain some valuable information from intervention studies. Um, so I think trying to understand the context, understand what's going on, taking a developmental lens and understanding the social environment as it's influenced by parents and, and coaches. That's probably where I'd start. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Um, my question goes into the function of emotion. What is the function, in your opinion, the function of uh, emotion and how does it affect the need for uh, emotion regulation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I would refer to, there's a, a large body of work on the social functions of emotions from Keltner and Haight and um, Van Cleef's emotion as social information model. Parkinson has done a lot of work on emotions as, you know, emotions having social functions. Emotions function at different levels. They can in, um, function individually in telling us what's important to us, what our needs are, what needs aren't being met. They can, as we infer those from others, we might understand what 
what others' needs aren't being met or how we could help meet those needs. Um, they also function to communicate values about what's important. So a coach expressing disappointment after a loss versus dis um, expressing anger after a loss could express different things about their perceived expectations for that team's performance, but also you know, their expectations for you know, what's appropriate in terms of emotion expression. Um, and then emotions can also function at a cultural or societal level in telling us what values are important in society. So emotions can function at different levels and they can communicate different values. So I'm not sure if that fully answered your questions, but I, I can certainly share more resources and references on theoretical models in that area. <laughs> the second part of the question, how does this function affect our need for emotion regulation? because there's a social function, and if we are down-regulate our emotions, we lose this function. Right, yeah, it's a good question, the interaction between emotion experience, emotion expression, and emotion regulation. So, um, in you know, clinical models of emotion awareness, emotions have um, an expression, they have, typically, they're associated with either approach or avoidance behaviors, but they also reflect needs related to identity or attachment. And so depending on the different ways in which those emotions are expressed or suppressed, others may not even know that we have those needs that need to be fulfilled. And so that's where it can get quite complicated. And I think back to the work that I mentioned about coaches taking a very individualized approach with their athletes. And those coaches who know their athletes quite well can maybe tell when their athletes are experiencing greater anxiety or frustration and might be better able to regulate or help try to regulate those athletes' emotions. As a, so all of this is to say that it also um, is influenced by the relationship that people have with one another before we start getting into understanding the actions that are going on between them. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, Over. way over here. Uh, yes, I'm wondering how much would you learn a team or a coach um, interpersonal emotion regulation while at the same time you might want to be careful with uh, dependency? I'm sorry, it was really echoey, so I just couldn't okay. hear you if you could repeat the question. Yes, so um, how much would you learn a, a team or a coach interpersonal emotion regulation while at the same time you might want to be careful with dependency? Oh, with dependency. Yeah, that's a great question. I think one of the things, we haven't done a lot of work in that area, so I think that's an area ripe for future research. Um, one of the things that it reminds me of is other work that we'd done on social support among elite female athletes, um, which suggested that sometimes coaches and support staff take on such uh, important roles in trying to smooth out all of the athletes' um, stressors and anything that could distract them from performance, um, which is very helpful in performance context and in preparing for Olympics and World Championships. But when athletes that are moving towards retirement or transitioning out of sport, they may struggle or lack the capacity to deal with stressors or even know who to talk to to solve some of these problems. So. Um, so I think this is, it echoes some things we've heard in other research that in an effort to try to help athletes to prepare them for performance, we may actually also be um, depriving them of the opportunity to think about how to deal with all of these things. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. I don't, I don't have a straightforward answer because I do think we do need more research on that topic. Thank you. We have time for one or maybe two, depend on the length of the answer one or two questions more, or anyone else? Oh, we've got Marcus, I don't know. Over there. Yes. <laughs> Over there. Chris. Thanks, Catherine, for excellent keynote. I know you mentioned at the end about the um, parents and their um, interpersonal emotions or interpersonal emotional regulation. And I just wonder um, what your thoughts are around um, parents and in individual sports and their relationships with their child sort of before, during, after competition, because I see that work in terms of their um, 
often struggle to manage their emotions towards their children is actually really key in this field. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think we don't want to also neglect that children's sport participation is also a very emotional experience for parents. I admit I don't have children, so I'm only going off of what I see and hear from others, but obviously it's a very emotional experience and you, have, you want what's best for your child. You want them to experience success and positive emotions. And, and so um, from the research that, that we've done and that has been conducted and looking at how parents attempt to navigate that experience before, during, and after competition by um, yourself and others in this room, Sam Elliott, I'm thinking of, um, we know that this is a very fraught situation and often parents really recognize that they struggle to manage their own emotions. And if we think about the work on emotional contagion, we know that emotions can influence one another. So I think we, we can start with the parent and recognizing how their own emotions are influencing others, how their emotional expressions might be influencing their child, and then to help parents dealing with their own emotions can then help them to deal with their child. Um, and the research in the parenting and developmental psychology literature, I think, and especially in clinical and applied work in that field, would generally, I think, say the same thing, that we need to start with the parent and then the parent connecting with the child and trying to understand where are they, where, what is my child feeling, what must they be going through right now, um, and trying to start from a point of empathy and connection um, before moving on to here's what you did wrong, here's what you need to do better. I think we need to start really from an emotional point, but that really does in, um, involve parents being able to um, recognize and reflect on their own emotions because that can spill over and influence the child. So lots more work to be done in that area as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to ask everyone to join me in a big applaud for the uh, excellent presentation Thank you. Of, from Catherine. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And this is, uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks again. Thanks for sticking with me. Looking forward to seeing another keynote later this afternoon and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>